when is it exactly unfair to refuse to give reasons for a legal decision? Well, that's when you have to read the case law. <laughs> 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 that was the whole point, exactly. It's the common law. You've got to read the precedent and discern the kinds of circuits. I'm sure you could apply a machine learning model to give you oh, a prediction. Oh, there's been a problem that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a simple problem. Yeah. <laughs> you have some questions? Um, a question on the idea of um, so the Siri example essentially, and and you know the idea that their their claim, you know, what what make of is we were doing privacy by design, and that's mm. why we pseudonym pseudonymized your ID and, and we were doing the right thing and, and actually this is the right thing to do. And I see this at the scale that I'm operating at. You know, people are too scared to write a name into a spreadsheet and they want me to provide a pseudonymization service for that name. Mm. And first of all, that's costly, going back to an earlier point. Um, but second of all, it may be counterproductive because of a point you raised later in your presentation, which is that um, that may cause problems for subject access requests and, and other things down the line. So. I just wanted to you know, get, get some further thoughts on, on you know, the, the, the trade-off between pseudonymization and, and compliance under GDPR. Uh, yeah, super, thank you. Um, I think it's difficult because what Apple are doing there is they're essentially pseudonymizing it and then throwing away the key. Um, and mm. that's a really thing that I don't think has been anticipated properly in, in the GDPR. And there's not really a word for it in there. That's the thing. It's, it's, you know, uh, it's data that we know is identifiable again, but it, we're just holding. Um, I really think that the way to do this is the kind of per like transparency aimed at third-party actors, empowered third-party oversight bodies to say this is the kind of thing we're doing. This should be written into a, D into a DPIA firstly, and it's not explicitly in DPIA guidance that those kind of things have to be considered. Um, it's a, the DPIA guidance that Article 29 Working Party produces already all over the place because they produce the guidance on DPIAs and now their additional guidance on different areas keeps adding things to that previous guidance. So there's no one document that really contains things that should be in a DPIA. It's quite, and it will be increasing over time what that needs to be. Um, uh, there is, so what, one thing that we do say in our paper, the, the first one on the list, uh, that there are several mechanisms which you could use. And one of them is an interesting one, I think, and it's one that's really underexplored. So Sandra was talking earlier on about um, uh, the, basically the, the Article 22 rights and rights to, uh, again, to not be subject to significant uh, solely automated decisions. There's a core cool question here. This works for things that have legal effect. Taking away your rights is a legal effect. And a, and a decision, as the recital says, can include a measure. Um, so to the extent to which you might have to provide logic about somebody automatically, as you register for Siri, taking away your rights, because that is a, a significant automated measure that is occurring, is an interesting internal application of that transparency right. Uh, and it's a tough one, because yes, this is a design decision that maybe happens more upstream, and that's not a solely automated design decision, but all machine learning has got design decisions. It doesn't mean it's not an automated system. So can we repurpose some of these so-called explanation rights to give us more information about privacy architectures is the thing that we write about in that paper. And I think it's an interesting thing to test um, because the, the word decision is not defined. It may include a measure. This is definitely a measure. So, yeah, I'll tell you that. Um, pseudonymization is a measure. So that's what I think. Can I just ask Michael a question about that? So. The logic there is that by engaging in synonymization, you have interfered with the data subject's right. Yeah. You have, so the logic there is not in pseudonymization. By, by, by de-identifying a data set to the extent where you, you will then make the choice in, in a DPIA, you have to really say, we are taking away that data subject's right. I'm giving you data that is maybe able to be identified. I'm giving, you're giving me data with your name, and I make the choice to keep that data, but to get rid of the ability for, for the, to delete the name, to delete the address, and so on, um, so I can't contact you, so you can't use your rights. Now, that's a purposive choice, and that will happen in an automated system. It won't be somebody manually choosing, do I get mm. rid of Karen, do I not get rid of Brent? You know, that's not going to happen. So because this has a legal effect. 
just a very interesting jurisprudence, jurisprudential question yeah. about whether or not that amounts to an interference yeah, I, with the I, rights. I agree. I mean, we put it as a we put it as an option in the paper. Because you could argue that yeah. it doesn't interfere with your right. It simply reduces the scope of the rights which you have, yeah. and that is not an interference. Right. Technically speaking, it's a jurisprudential yeah. question because, in fact, what you're saying is you've done something technical that reduces the scope of the right. thing that's protected yeah. under the GDPR. So I don't know the answer to that, yeah. but it's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and therefore, Marie? Um, so we're talking about Article 10, which says... We're talking about Article 10 in Article... Um, of the uh, logic of processing. Article what? 11 is, is, the, yeah. is the... Article 11 is the... Yes, of course, yeah. Article 11, and you're talking about the other right, access right, 12, 13, yeah. uh, 13 12 to 15. Yeah. yeah? And I don't think that the uh, legal effect depends on an interference. But in this case, it's about uh, the measure. Hmm? Hmm. You took a measure which basically resulted in uh, Article 11 becoming applicable. Right? Am I correct? Yes. So oh. it reminds me of a Rijkeboer. Oh, yeah, yes. So we write about the Rijkeboer case in, yeah, in our of paper. Yeah. Um, so could, could you remind some of us what that is? Yeah. <laughs> it's a really weird case, actually. <laughs> it's, it's a Dutch case, yes. isn't it? So I think, if I'm correct, that it's about somebody... It was an administrative law case where uh, somebody asked for data about how he was treated or the reasons... Who he was transferred to. Who, who, tra who the Rotterdam Council transferred his data to. Is the right of the case. Yeah, I th I, what I remember is that they said, no, we destroy all that data after yep. uh, one year or something like that, so we can't give it to you. Mm -hmm. And then the court said, um, there is, uh, this is a balancing act between your right to have access to your personal data on the one hand and uh, data minimization on the other hand. And this is what returns in Article 11. So Article 11, if I, uh, I don't know it by heart, Maybe you do. <coughs> you're this, this you're not a lawyer, so no. maybe you do. <laughs> this is the article that, I mean, we're talking the same article. The article 11 in GDPR states that the controller does not need to retain uh, basically I, I def directly identifying data about you in order, if they're not planning to use that data to single you out. It's just for the purposes of giving those rights. So yeah. if I'm going to use that data for aggregate analysis, I don't need to keep the data about who Karen is, mm -hmm. just because she might choose to use her right of access. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you then cannot force the data controller to re-identify you. That's actually what it says yeah. in Article 11. Yeah. Hmm. So it's, I think it's a balancing act. May I follow that up with? Yeah, sure, and just before you follow it up, just, just to say that I know it, it may sound like quite an exotic situation, but I suspect <laughs> this may happen fairly often. Um, uh, in the coming years, because this could be quite a common method that, that people use. Yeah, that's what I figure. Um, I have an issue with everything is personal data and everything is sensitive data. I think the way to put it is to say anything. Yeah, I was being, hi it was hyperbole, I yeah. do agree, yes, anything. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but that makes it very interesting, because I would propagate that, that anything at some point can be personal data. Like if I know that you were in London and that uh, there was a, a storm, right? And in the period where I knew that you were in London, there was only one day where there was a storm. Then the storm becomes personal data and that makes sense. So that anything can become personal data, I think is a good thing. Then the next thing, what happens is that because of the amount of data that we are collecting, uh, anything moves towards everything. Now you can say, oh, well, then let's throw out the General Data Protection Regulation. No. <laughs> <laughs> On the contrary, this is what we need because of this move of anything to everything. Um, a small point that suddenly occurred to me about the ex ante and ex post um, right to explanation or access to the logic of processing. So how we have explained since, since 2008, the situation around profiling is so the data controller processes personal data, makes inferences 
builds profiles. Those profiles are not personal data. Then he takes the profile and applies it to a person whose data match. At that moment, he's again processing personal data, and at that moment, he has to give the logic of processing. Article 13, 14, and 15. That's ex post. That has nothing to do with the moment when you're building the profiles. But the minute you apply them, it becomes personal data, the application. And then you have to provide a logic of processing. Um, the last point is about reasons. I had the feeling that you were talking administrative law about reasons again. Well, that is not the same as an explanation. And uh, with Brent, I had the same idea. So you're talking about um, counterfactuals, about classifiers. For me, classifiers are explanations of how your system has um, matched me uh, on what uh, the automated decision was based, but that's not a reason. Whether it's a reason depends on legal things. Like, um, if I say, okay, the system has figured out that you are a woman, therefore you drive less dangerous, so I I put down your premium. And the other side is you're a man, so you pay a higher premium. So that is the classifier. But it's not a reason it's not allowed. So you can't give that as a reason. You can explain, and under data protection law, you have to explain. I, I, I would say, article, we just discussed that. But it's not the same as giving a reason. And I think it is very important to um, that somebody writes a PhD on <laughs> <laughs> Because I think it's really very fascinating. So that's interesting. Listening to Murray, I'm getting the impression that on your understanding, the distinct, there's a distinction between reasons and an explanation, and reasons are valid legal reasons, and explanations are something broader. Yes, and I would, I would pin it down to the law. So the law requires you to give ah. a reason. That reason can be found somewhere. So your reason might be freedom of contract. Okay, so you think reasons mean legal reasons. Yes. And certainly yes. British administrative law is not at all limited to legal reasons. You can give bad reasons, and then the person says, aha, I'm going to bring a judicial review action. You just need to tell me why you did that to me. And if it turns out that that was unlawful, you're going to slap a judicial review application in there yeah. and get the decision wiped. So in but British I'm administrative law, reasons are not confined only to lawful reasons. But you're saying that the conclusion at some point is unlawful, right? So that means there, is, there must be a difference between a lawful reason and an unlawful reason. Yes, of course there is. Okay, but so where the right to reasons is not con confined to requiring the decision maker only to articulate the lawful reasons. <laughs> it also includes bad reasons. Anyway, <laughs> I, I can feel that under the common law, the six theses have to be written. Yes, quite. <laughs> <laughs> or 225. <laughs> So in an attempt to be reasonable, um, <laughs> I just wonder if I, could, if I can recap that to see if I got it straight and perhaps help some others in the room. <laughs> sorry, so, sorry, everyone. <laughs> I, my understanding, please correct me if this is wrong, so Brent was, was, was providing, was proposing a method to provide an explanation, not specifically intended to satisfy the letter of the GDPR, but to satisfy something which would be very useful in the spirit of the GDPR. And I think you're saying that this is not a legal reason, which I think Brent would agree with, and Karen saying, but it still may be useful under UK law. Is that a fair summary? I think there's one step in between. So the GDPR <laughs> requires you to explain. Yeah? But um, after having explained, you may still need to give a reason. Like <clears throat> the example I gave, if the court said, well, I didn't sleep well last night, that's why I gave you a high punishment, that's an explanation, right? But it's not a reason. Yeah. In British law, that would also be a reason. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so he could, like, <laughs> but, <laughs> but certainly <laughs> not. <laughs> but <laughs> certainly <laughs> not a lawful reason. <laughs> or is it? It would get wiped. <laughs> but it's still a reason. <laughs> but not a lawful reason, right? It's an unlawful reason, but it still counts exactly. as a reason. Okay. So just so checking terms. I'm only talking about <laughs> lawful reasons. La lawful reason is the same as justification for you, is that right? Yes, yes. that's right. Good, good, good. And does justification mean something else in the UK? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> 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 um, we'll have, we'll have, we don't have uh, yeah. Lozen to give us a French view again. <laughs> Do we have more questions? So. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. 
this is a question for Michael. Um, just going back to the, yeah, the, the Syria example. So are you saying that um, Apple were not necessarily justified by hiding behind Article um, 11 um, in terms of sort of like decoupling, removing the identification and enabling the data not to be um, identifiable? Because it appears that under Article 11 that they are justified to be able to do that. So um, a few things. Firstly, uh, the GDPR isn't applicable to this case because it hasn't come into force yet. So in terms of the complaint that exists right now, I, I am showing how these are the practices that are existing. And while Apple do not, the interesting thing, while Apple do not uh, have an obligation in this moment to engage in data protection by design, uh, that's what they were claiming, or privacy by design, with their explicit claim to me as to their reasons for doing this. Secondly, I'm not claiming it's, firstly, I'm really not claiming it's an unlawful thing for um, Apple to remove personal data from that. There's no reason I don't believe that that is an unlawful thing to do, mm. um, uh, to delete the column with name or an address in, for example. What is potentially unlawful uh, is that Apple are able to quite clearly re-identify this data. And it is not allowed under the GDPR to, to refuse to build, which is what they claim to do in letters and correspondence I have with them. They said, we have not built a retrieval tool for this database either. The database is not structured in a way that we can pull it out by ID number. We haven't built a retrieval tool, so we can't give you the right. And that was not, that's not allowed. You can't, you can't just say, we haven't put the software system in place that is legally required, therefore we can't give you the right. So there is the question of, does the right of access compel them to, to give this data to me when it is actually within reason it is accessible to them, given especially they're a large technology company, uh, given that they have designed the system in such a way that I can't get my own identifier out of my phone, which is a very bizarre thing to have done. So I am really testing this with the regulator because I want to know where they go with, the, uh, with, with this. Um, and under the GDPR, there will be other grounds to fight out. You could probably under the, the GDPR focus more on Article 35, data protection by design, and say you are not designing for data, for data rights where you clearly could have done, um, and therefore you're in breach of Article 35. Um, so that, but you can't do that right now under the DPD. Uh, just a point of clarification, because I mean, you're saying clearly that Apple could, they could uh, recouple the, you know, the data and, and, and provide it for the data subject, but surely you should, there should be a way to demonstrate that outside of what they've actually done you know, before. And it has to be native to the particular circumstances. Which is a very point. difficult thing when you don't have transparency over privacy architectures. Yeah. It's very difficult to. Uh, and it's the point we make is not a case where we just say, look at how illegal Apple is. The paper we're writing is saying, look at the challenges we currently have with access rights in the GDPR in cases where it's not clear cut or easy for a data controller to identify. And even one of the top technology companies in the world, let alone you know, my technology company in a shack down the road that exists in my shed. You know understood that Article 11 basically tries to say, okay, if a company has all this data out there in different data sets and it costs an enormous amount of effort to re-identify them, mm. then please let's not require them to build the architecture in such a way that, that it's all immediately identifiable. Mm. I remember a Dutch case on Telford, where Telford actually said, look, if we have to re-identify this data, we can do it, but it costs a lot of money. Mm. If you're going to require that of us, we're going to have to reorganize the back end in a way that is much more privacy vulnerable. Mm. So I've always understood Article 11 mm. as protection, and I see the tension, yeah. so I think it's very interesting what you're doing, but it has the risk that you actually um, reduce the protection yeah, of completely. Uh, people. And so that's the real, yeah. that's a really big challenge there. That's why we talk about when, when these issues when these issues clash. Uh, Paul, uh, an interesting point that Paul Olivia Delahaye, who runs PersonalData.io and is a very big campaigner for access rights, um, uh, was one of the people who got the data. He was the first person to get the data out of Cambridge Analytica. Actually, uh, he was talking to me about something he recently got from Facebook, which was Facebook. He was trying to get re-identified on the basis of his advertiser ID to Facebook to pull out some data when he's you know, on different websites and pixels are tracking him all over the internet. And Facebook said, we, would give, we can do this data, we would give you this data, but it is not sustainable at the scale at which we operate to, op to offer this access right to anyone. So this too big to regulate argument is coming out quite a lot, which is, is kind of absurd in a way. And we have to, I think, to say this is something that 
we, is clearly personal data. We clearly could do it, but we can't do it because we have too many users. If we had fewer users but we're doing exactly the same thing, then we could do it. And I think these attentions we just have to make clear. So also, when you sign up to a service, you know what rights you're getting. When you sign up to Siri, you are not told anywhere in the privacy policy that you will not have a right of access. Um, and you actually might have, we have, we also discussed whether you have to be given the, in Article 13 and 14, whether they have to tell you when they're not providing a right in a context-specific way. They, I know they have to say, these are your rights, but do they have to say, these are your rights, and these are the ones that we're not providing for these categories of data, and why? Um, so what happens in a scenario where, as a, cons like, as a customer, you'd want that data to be wiped out? Um, so not just be able to access it, but actually just get Apple to wipe out that information. I mean, if they can't really trace back to your own individual data points, then how are they meant to do that? Mm -hmm. And I guess like it's not really that relevant now that GDPR is not really in place yet, but in a situation where it was, what would happen. Still, you still would have that right under the Data Protection Directive, mm -hmm. um, uh, th you, but the. So they have to identify. Well, so they do. They do. They do have because they do obviously have thought about the privacy implications of this before to some degree. Their current policy is that when you press the off switch in Siri, it will delete your data for the last six months on their server, the one that still has the identifier, but it won't delete the data after six months where they've cleansed the identifier off. So they are erasing only your recent data, but not later. So there is a way to erase some of the data. Um, but obviously, that's not the only right that you have of interest. But so that's uh, yeah. In the moment, I, I asked for it to be erased for two years, and they will say you can't identify you. I think it's a really interesting case, and I think the, the most relevant issue seems to be this one about transparency. Just being really clear as the consumer or the user of these services, what rights you are acquiring and what rights you are not. And I suspect the resistance on the part of those companies to make that clear is for fear of somehow it being misinterpreted as a malintent. We're not giving you these rights because we're, we're, we're going to position ourselves differently, wherever it might be. But I do, my, my, my question, actually, is one of the interface between this debate, which is intricate, detailed, highly expert, um, and I'm just marrying that with the um, the general population's values. So, uh, theoretically, we could argue for extreme protections. Right? Now, I suspect the dial has moved a little bit in the last couple of weeks on what I think how my data ought to be protected. But I suspect the elasticity on that is probably going to shift, yes, slightly towards this end, but not quite as far. And I do think that the, the, the value add of these conversations is how do you bring those two together to a place that actually feels feasible and also in line with what society feels the norms might be, because those trade-offs are ones that people might be willing to make. Mm. Not that I'm saying I would, but I just think you know, generally it's a debate worth having. Karen, you were nodding. Well, well so I, just, I, I agree with that. Actually, <laughs> this is a really intricate, highly expert discussion. And actually, there are... And how do we marry those very technical discussions that do have potentially quite serious implications with actually, I think we have to ask a bigger question about what is the good digital society? What does that actually mean for us in practice? How do we make those trade-offs? Those are such difficult things to work out, but we have to start working them out in a way that is meaningful to most people. And I think that's going to be the challenge, is bridging this gap between the highly technical reality and the intricate questions with, you know, having a set of and a clear sense of what orientates our vision of the good digital life. Yeah. I don't know how we do that, but I think that's what we have to try and get to. Well, the answer to that is actually having, having some systems of good broad deliberative democracies Agreed. and policy making yeah. and we've done it in other areas we've done it in healthcare actually the example that you gave around um the heart surgery um outcomes so i was working in medical regulation at the time i know that case particularly well and you know actually healthcare went through a major change why as a result of 
full-scale, engaged, deliberative policy make. It's plausible and it's possible if there was a will to do it, is yeah. my view. I mean, I'd like to think that, but I think part of the problem is this unique nature of, of digital data. Yeah. Yeah. That, it, that actually it's, it's so collectible and so permanent, <laughs> you know, and so transferable that it's so difficult then to work out the implications of of what the digital life looks like. That's why I think actually it comes down to the really tricky nature of digital data and what we can do with it. I think the principle of privacy paradox that people talk about is connected with a specific choice architecture that we are faced with. And data protection law tries to change that choice architecture that has major consequences which some business models will not survive. And um, then people might come up and say, well, people don't care anyway because blah, blah, blah. Yes, based on that choice architecture, they couldn't care. So yeah. all, all we need is a, a careful, national, thoughtful <laughs> debate <laughs> about <laughs> these, uh, these simple issues. We need to try hard. <laughs> 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 We're going to try. Or an artificially um, intelligent AI consent predictor. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> all what yeah, we would, we would have agreed to, to in what the what the good life looks like, and then we'll be fine. <laughs> we have one, one last comment from Charles, please. Um, it's a, a, a point for Karen, but first of all, I can't resist a very apt quote, which comes, strangely enough, from Rodgers and Hammerstein's <laughs> South Pacific, and the wonderful song called Some Enchanted Evening, which is a love song. Can you sing it? No, because I don't have a backing band. <laughs> <laughs> but the lyrics, and these are copyrights, so if you want to use it, you have to get... Um, <laughs> to say it. Well. It's, who, who can explain it? Who can tell you why? Fools give you reasons. Wise men never try. So there you can put that into your, into <laughs> your footnotes. Nice, thank but you. the point I want, I want to ask about Karen, um, we've read the same book and have reviewed the same book. Right. And I forgot what I said. So yes, I, I, looked up what, <laughs> <laughs> I looked up what I said. And um, no, the, the serious points about it is that, first of all, that's not political science. And, and as a political scientist, I slightly resent uh, the, the, the conclusion that political science really doesn't deal with these things. Maybe it doesn't, but not because of what that book says or doesn't. Most of the contributors to that book are not political scientists. Only Christopher Hood and maybe one other are. The rest are economists and lawyers and philosophers. Um, but the point is that th that book has pros and cons about transparency. Yeah. Uh, it was occasioned by, uh, it was a conference, I think you mentioned this, in celebration of the Freedom of Information Act. And the Freedom of Information Act does not stand for all of transparency. Not sure. And it also depends upon what, your, what the goal is, or what the dependent variable is, if you like. Uh, and if it is a, a, a goal which comes out of political theory, that is to say that transparency improves decision making, uh, or on the other hand, that it uh, prevents corruption, which is a different kind of thing, or on the other hand, uh, there are three hands there, uh, that, that it enables the individual to pursue their rights you know, to, to an explanation or to, or to whatever. That depends very much on how one views um, uh, FOI and, and the, the ability to get or not to get explanations. So I think that uh, it may well be that um, the real question that n a number of those authors address is what would it take for that kind of transparency, FOI type transparency, to achieve whatever object it is and what is missing now. By now, I meant 10 years ago when that book was, was published. And so Honora Anil talks about uh, the distorted communication process and you need to undistort the communication process in order to, to do it better. Uh, other people, I forget exactly what they they address, but all of them have kinds of, of, of remedies that would make it possible for transparency to achieve certain sorts of goals. So I think one needs to have a more nuanced understanding of what, uh, not just that book, but of what political science might be contributing to our understanding of the importance of transparency. Very good. Karen, do you want to have a final yeah, comment? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I disagree with you. What I was trying to emphasize, I think, in those reflections is that 
they, because they were sort of gathered around this new piece of legislation, which was motivated by a desire to enhance transparency in government, what did they tell us about that challenge of taking a legal measure that was in, in, intended to improve governmental transparency and what, were, what was the experience and what were the challenges and what were the tensions associated with trying to do that? And that there were parallels in thinking about what one of the things that the GDPR is trying to do is it's a legal measure that's trying to improve transparency in algorithmic decision making. And might we then learn from those reflections and experience in thinking about those challenges? So that was the primary thing that I was trying to draw out and that there were a number of tensions that they encountered. And particularly the problem between nominal attempts to try and improve things that people think are just bureaucratic and winces and a real commitment to what the underlying policy goals are and that was kind of Onora's frustration was we say that we care about this and actually we've we've not helped at all we've just introduced a whole layer of mechanisms that people have to comply with and to what end and so that was what I was trying to get out as a lesson for what the GDPR is trying to do. Yeah. I um, think the authors of that book were chosen because of their scepticism. Right. Actually. Yeah, I, I don't know. I wasn't there, so you might be right. right. There was only one lawyer, actually, which is also interesting, who championed the cause of transparency in that book, and surprisingly, not a single privacy yeah, lawyer. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, and there was, there was not a single privacy lawyer. On, on Karen's note of, of going uh, beyond bureaucracy, <laughs> I think we'll, we'll draw this day draw this day to a close. Before we thank the uh, the wonderful speakers in this session, uh, I'm going to attempt uh, to try to do a quick recap of what we've heard today. I'm sure I'll miss out all kinds of important points. I'm just going to give a few a few points that every, everyone's mentioned. Um, first, I hope everyone agrees that it's been a really fascinating mm -hmm. day. Um, and uh, noting that we have a well-deserved drinks reception coming <laughs> up just in a few minutes, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, so. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank all of our, our speakers. I think everyone's done a fantastic job. Um, Murray started us off. Um, she pointed out that micro-targeting may not work, but still decisions are based on it. Um, she raised issues of hyper-connectivity and a digital unconscious, and um, has, has pointed out that we mustn't confuse explanation with justification. Um, Sandra argued that GDPR is good, but we still have a way to go. She asked uh, very important questions about what is fairness and do we always need full transparency. She also asked the interesting question about, in some cases, who do you trust more, a human or an algorithm? Elizabeth, who unfortunately is not with us anymore, but we're very glad that she could be with us briefly, um, she, um, she pointed out that the biggest risks to privacy are driven by new technology and that privacy and innovation must go hand in hand. Uh, it's particularly challenging as we see great increases in the volume, velocity, and value of data. Uh, Jonathan Cooley pointed out that data has become a top topic for all of his clients, um, sees today as an awakening moment, a big moment for privacy law, where we need to recognize that uh, data is an asset, and we need to, to maintain logs for our data assets. He also pointed out, perhaps a bit worryingly, that he'd never met a, uh, a technical person who could explain simply how an algorithm works. Um, <laughs> so we, need, we have work to do there. Um, Christina emphasized that uh, it's essential that we maintain human centricity as a key element before we even start to build technology, and um, suggested that we are at an inflection point of digital, digital trust now, that we can view GDPR as an occasion to transform trust to opportunity. Um, Sophia noted that uncertainty has a chilling effect on business, and that's worrying because the GDPR is complex. Um, Michael Ross picked up on that, um, noted that there are many potentially unintended consequences of GDPR, um, and that the combination of a, of a lack of clarity with huge potential fines can lead to bad risk-adjusted behavior. Even noted the idea of a, a, a data death spiral. <laughs> data death spiral. <laughs> He also suggested, and this, this is an interesting point, he suggested that perhaps the number of people who care about, uh, about these data issues, he called them data fundamentalists, he suggested that perhaps the number who really care are a small number, but they're very vocal, which is an interesting, an interesting thing to, to think about. Um, Noza, uh, uh, very happy that Noza came to visit us from France, give us a French perspective. She pointed out that the law is good, but it's not sufficient, um, and we need ways to check if consent is really effective, i.e. We, we need to have ways to audit if the law has been applied. 
Um, and to do that effectively will we'll require international collaboration and interdisciplinary efforts. Karen brought up the very interesting, important question about what does transparency mean, and uh, noted that it's not an unalloyed good. Um, that there may be unavoidable trade-offs and that the context matters. Um, our hyper-connected digital age, which refers back to one of Murray's point, requires a more nuanced treatment. Brent discussed uh, the, the fascinating question of how can we give a meaningful explanation and proposed counterfactual explanations as one uh, very helpful way forward. Michael Veal um, noted that we need to balance control and confidentiality, that there's a, a double-edged sword of privacy-enhancing technologies, and that lack of clarity around the black magic of cryptographic methods um, raises important questions. Um, what are and what should be the limits of personal data, and how can we deal with inferred special category data? Um, so please, let, let's give a warm, uh, warm round of applause to all of our speakers today.